fine. That's fine. That's great. Fine. Thank you. I look forward to the chatting to you later. So, thank you for joining this webinar. I know everyone's there's so many webinars going on at the moment. Everyone's kind of webinared out. Um, in a moment, we're going to be asking you to kind of tell us about your role and why you're interested in ICAM or information knowledge management, I should say. So we thought we'd kick off by, you know, it's only fair that we say a little bit by why we're here and kind of what brought us to this point in time. So I'm Julia Barrett um, and with Sukena Bawani, we run the We Adapt Climate Change Adaptation Knowledge Sharing Platform, which is a, a global platform. Um, and that really focuses on building a community of practice, connecting people with relevant material, supporting learning and knowledge sharing and networking in this field. So really promoting that kind of community of practice uh, between people. And knowledge discovery has been a really key aspect of this. Um, we find that users really want to quickly and easily find related information and it needs to be really accessible uh, so that they can best use it. Um, and this has been this has led to many collaborations and I'll just pass over to Sakena to say a few more words on that. Thank you, Julia. Great to see so many people online. Hello, everybody. Yes, as Julia says, so Julia and I are from the Stockholm Environment Institute in Oxford at the Oxford Centre. And um, the work that we've been doing over the past nearly 20 years around knowledge management and knowledge sharing has really meant that ICAM is a key feature of our work. So in managing the knowledge, um, the adaptation knowledge platform we adapt, but also in many of the collaborative projects we've been doing um, with some of you who are online, in fact, um, around adaptation. So many projects which, um, there are many projects which um, have tried to catalog and classify adaptation actions um, such as the UNEP Provia guidance, for example, which many of you probably have heard of. Um, and precursors to that were things like the mediation um, pathfinder. Um, and even earlier than that was, were things like the Adam project. And so there's been a long history of trying to classify and categorize adaptation actions, strategies, methods, approaches to increase learning between our communities. Um, and what's often impeded this is a lack of um, standardization between how knowledge is shared, within how knowledge is shared, but also um, a proliferation of information and terminology. So the way in which language is used and the way in which language is interpreted is also a barrier often. Um, so we have amazing case studies, but often very little way to connect them and to learn from each other. And this often leads to the replication, redundancy, and so on. So the project we've been working on for the past five years, I think some of you joined our final conference a couple of weeks ago, is the Placard Project. And this is an EC coordination and support action, part of Horizon 2020, which aims to promote better communication, collaboration, and coordination between the climate change adaptation and disaster risk reduction communities. And throughout this project, terminology and language and the use of different terms and um, the interpretation of uh, language in different ways was often raised as a key barrier to this collaboration and communication. Um, and a big part of the project was how to strengthen institutions and institutional mandates to better coordinate action. Um, and so this is why IKM became a big part of this project actually. And so we had a lot of stakeholder workshops and dialogues to try and understand the barriers that stakeholders face in their day-to-day -day work in trying to fulfill their institutional mandates. And addressing these barriers is really the driving motivation behind the work we've done and the roadmap that we are going to discuss today. So as a quick um, icebreaker and to see who's online, we were wondering if everyone would be happy to switch on their cameras if you have not already done so, so we can see who's in the room. That's great. And we thought we might ask you a couple of questions just as a quick teaser to find out what people are interested in terms of ICAM and how much whether you think they're useful or not. Um, so one question, so you all have your camera in front of you. So if you put your finger over your camera, some of you are part of the 
placard conference last week, so you probably saw us do this already. So we're just going to follow in Margot's footsteps here. Um, so if you all cover your camera for the moment and uncover your camera if you think you have some understanding of why taxonomies are useful. Ah, quite a lot. And uncover your camera, please, if you're a knowledge manager as well. And if you're a user, you consider yourself a user of information. Okay, great. Thank you. Now, the other thing we were going to do is, I think um, Andrew, who's helping us facilitate the um, webinar today, has already shared this in the chat, but we have a Google Doc. Um, the link is in the chat. We have a Google Doc, which is a, sort of a collaborative notes document for us. And there, we were just hoping that you would be um, happy to share your a bit of information about yourself. So I'm just going to share that on my screen right now. Um, so basically, just share a little bit about who you are, where you're, um, where you come from, and what kind of interest you have in IKM, and why you, um, why you're interested in IKM actually, so that we can that helps us to reflect on whether this roadmap is useful and whether it's addressing the needs that people have basically. So I hope you can see my screen. And here we just have, um, it's a collaborative notes document here. And we just have a box here that says name, job role, country, and what your interest in IKM is. And if you're happy to use the suggesting mode here in the Google doc, for those who are not familiar with it, and just type your name and your role, and what your interest is in IKM, and it can be literally a couple of a sentence or two. Um, this document is also important because um, further down we have some useful resources that might be of interest, which you can um, come back to after the webinar. And also later we'll talk about different ways in which we can engage as a community, um, and there are multiple ways of doing that here, so you can opt to um, opt in or opt out of that um, if you want to add your name there. Okay. Hand back to Julia before my mic dies here. Yeah? And um, uh, we're getting some, so we can see some additions to the Google Doc, that's nice. Okay, so I'll hand back to Julia for now and uh, she'll take us through the agenda. Great, that's fantastic. And I say we'll be sharing that Google Doc around um, all the participants and there will be a recording of the webinar available as well. So just a little bit of word on the webinar. So we're going to be discussing um, what we think the key information knowledge management challenges are, what the user needs are that we found through our engagement with stakeholders through the placard project, how we think a shared taxonomy can help um, and the bigger picture. So how shared taxonomy can set the stage the kind of smarter ICAM and AI, and this is going to talk about ontologies and a little bit about knowledge graphs, although we also have another webinar coming up on that. Um, and finally, exploring this collaborative roadmap for how we can get there. And we're really looking forward to hearing from you about that. You know, what do you think of it? Did we miss something? Is anyone interested in, in working on that? You know, can we move forward together? And what might the next steps be? So I'll pass back to Sukena to start kick us off about the uh, ICAM challenges and user needs. Thank you. So Thanks, much. Julia. So the biggest ICAM challenges we face at the moment, and we have been facing increasingly over the past five years, are the amount of data that we, we are faced with on a daily basis. And organizing and analyzing these vast amount of data is particularly difficult if there's no structure or common format or standard for this data. In addition to that, we have a fragmentation of information. We have knowledge scattered across multiple platforms, portals, and websites, even though objectives of these websites may be quite similar. And this really leads to a deepening and hardening of information silos. Um, and the connections between these different strands of work becomes increasingly harder to make as more and more knowledge emerges. Additionally, we have these disparate terminologies that we've talked about. Communities ha often have their own way of describing things, which are completely legitimate. 
um, but they often use different terms, sometimes to mean the same things. And this re results in an inconsistency sometimes in the way things are interpreted and understood. And in adaptation and DRR particularly, we often use different terms in different ways. And uh, this also leads to missed opportunities for collaboration. The increasing um, frustration for users in this is, is what's basically emerged from a lot of the stakeholder engagement that we've done. So when we've asked users what they really need and what they really want, some of the key things have are around enhanced discoverability and searchability of information. So the ability to quickly and um, easily find things. Also to have fewer entry points between um, regional, national and international platforms. So finding content individually through separate platforms is also quite an issue. Um, Additionally, sometimes having automated alert systems that inform people about new content can be interesting, such as help desks or um, request services that are emerging more and more. Some of these are automated, but again, automation is really dependent on standardization. And as we have mentioned, terminology and language comes up again and again amongst both experts and non-experts. So the thing that we feel has emerged as a key, one of the key solutions to this, um, so to a lot of these issues, is around the widespread use and development of a shared taxonomy within our communities. Taxonomies are collections of terms that together describe a topic area, and they provide an overview of a vocabulary that's used and how these terms relate to each other. This is the climate tagger screenshot that you can see here, and this is just an, one example of how um, the topic area is uh, structured here, and this is similar in, in lots of taxonomies. But importantly for us, taxonomies are a really important IKM tool because they provide the keywords that we use to tag content online, which helps us categorize content, but also link it to other content online. So we use these keywords to describe papers, reports, case studies, and make them easier to find. And you can find these in action on lots of websites. For example, Nature here. A key feature here is that the metadata that's additional to the taxonomy is really important as well, such as definitions, notes on term usage, how term usage has, a term usage has changed, which is often important in our area. And you can see here, there's lots of related terms, there's lots of related content, and that's the power of the taxonomy here. Taxonomies are also are often implemented in the, in the background of websites, so you don't really see a lot of that, um, the, the, the more technical stuff that's going on in the background. But as you saw on the Nature website, it becomes very user-friendly. In the back end, this is pool party software that we're using to help build um, a taxonomy for adaptation and DRR. And here, the things that are important are things like the alternative labels or synonyms. So this is metadata that provides a way to connect data across different communities, for example. If one community describes EBA or um, nature-based solutions in one way, synonyms can be used to connect these things across different communities. You also have broader and narrower terms, related terms, definitions, and scope notes. And scope notes are very important because they describe how terms are used but they also describe how terms are not used or how they're not used in this particular. So keyword tagging is already widely used across adaptation and DRR platforms and websites, and some are live. They can be used to access content tagged with a certain keyword. Sometimes they're used more for classification. And some do have metadata, but most of them don't. They don't have definitions or they don't have scope notes. Um, and the other thing that taxonomies help with is faceted searches. So you can really kind of dig down into data if you have a more standardized structure. So taxonomies and keyword tagging are really useful in IKM and potentially really powerful for linking content, suggesting related content and supporting a deeper understanding. However, platforms and websites typically use their own separate vocabulary and taxonomy. And these taxonomies are not connected and they only usually work within a platform or a website. They often use different variations of terms, the synonyms we've talked about, and few of these taxonomies contain metadata that incorporates definitions and scope notes, as I've said. 
So one way of overcoming these challenges that face IKM and meeting user needs that we've heard time and again, especially over the course of the placard project and through our We Adapt experiences too, is the development and widespread use of a shared taxonomy for tagging content online. And this would incorporate all the terms currently being used, but also include details of related terms that can be used to suggest content and provide the metadata to support an even deeper understanding and even an understanding for people who are new to this subject area who maybe don't know that there is related content that they could be looking at with, a, with an initial search that they do. So one example of the development and widespread use of such a taxonomy is a, a, a search and discovery tool that we've developed in Placard called the Connectivity Hub. Some of you may have seen this, so I'll just go over it quite quickly. But the hub has basically been designed to enhance the search and discovery of existing information online. So it currently connects to five platforms, um, five adaptation and DRR platforms, and it tries to connect this fra fragmented knowledge across the networks and across the knowledge domain. So this is a screenshot of the hub. The um, URL is there if you want to visit it, it's live now. And there's also a video there that gives you a quick um, walkthrough um, how to use it and why, why it could be useful for your work. So the hub is really um, there to support several of the challenges that we've talked about. One of them is harmonizing terminology across the two domains. The other is to support coordination, collaboration and learning um, as part of the placard remit. And this is all done through keyword tagging based on the taxonomies of these different platforms and their use of metadata. So for example, if you were to click on a keyword here, the orange node here is the keyword and it shows the landscape of data associated with this keyword. The blue um, circles are articles and reports and the green circles are organizations. So if you were to use the filter on the, on the left hand side to just look at the organizations connected to this keyword, you would be able to see which organizations are working on this particular topic area. And similarly, to try and support the um, understanding of terminology and language that we've just described earlier, if you were to click on a keyword, it would provide a definition of what that keyword means. And to go into a bit more detail, I'll just quickly show you that if you were to click on nature-based solutions, for example, you would be um, presented with the things that we saw in the pool party backend. So you would see the synonym, the alternative label, and you'd also see the related content. So have you also considered EBA? Have you also considered ecosystem services? And you can flick them through click them through into the different knowledge landscapes of these related terms. So you have a lot more flexibility just because there's a bit of standardization in the system. You have scope notes here too, and you have a glossary as you would find on um, Nature or Wikipedia or whatever. So if you hover over a term, you find further definitions. Um, and if you were to click on to some of these source items, you would get to the source of where that terminology is arising from. So as mentioned before, currently platforms and websites approach keyword tagging in different ways. Some are dynamic, and, but many of them are not. And to, in order to create the Collectivity Hub, we actually had to do a lot of work to connect all the keywords. So to sort of understand what, was, what were synonyms, or what were matching terms across platforms, but they were using terms differently, we had to do a lot of that work manually because that standardization doesn't exist. But there are content tagging systems that make it possible to implement taxonomies for keyword tagging in dynamic ways. And one example of this is the Climate Tagger. So we've been working with our partners REAP, um, who developed the Climate Tagger through Pool Party, um, uh, which is developed by the Semantic Web Company, for a number of years. And I'm really happy to say we have our colleague Denise Reaches here from Climate Tagger, who can tell us a little bit more about that. Can I hand over to you, Denise? Actually, unfortunately, so I've just been talking to Denise um, and she's having technical issues, so she can't join us today, but we can say a few words about the Climate Tagger. Um, so at the moment, the Climate Tagger is available in six languages and it does that Ooh, through... We don't the have Denise term. online. Sorry. Okay, well, I think we'll, we'll come back to Denise if she's, um, if she's dropped off and... Um, Hopefully she'll be able to give us a bit of background into Climate Tagger, in which case I'll hand over to Julia and she can take us through a bit more um, detail on the roadmap and 
what taxonomies can help us to achieve if we were to implement them. Great, thank you, Sukena. Um, can I just check that people can hear me? I'm not sure Sukena could. Yeah, we can hear you, Julia. Thank you very much, Andrew. Um, yeah, so apologies for that. Unfortunately, Denise is having some technical issues, but we can say a little bit about the climate tagger. As, as I was saying before, it's available in six languages, which it does through related terms. Um, and one of the really powerful things we use it for in WeirdApt is suggesting um, tags. So it can auto tag to a certain extent. Obviously, this needs to be supervised, but does this using text analytics based on taxonomy. So this is just an example of how we can use these, te these technologies to support a degree of standardization, um, but also helping to, you know, auto tag content, which when so many of us have so much content online, I think weird out we have um, two and a, over two and a half thousand items of content. So doing that retrospectively is a huge task. So there, there are these technologies that can facilitate these things. And that's what we wanted to show there. But if you go to the Climate Tagger website, um, which I think we'll put in the Google Doc, it provides a lot more information there. Um, so I just wanted to talk about where this leads to. So the connectivity hub is an example of what can be achieved with the widespread adoption of a shared taxonomy for tagging content online. And the climate tagger is an example of how such a taxonomy can be implemented um, and how this technology can support this kind of standardization. Um, so this is a really powerful way of connecting content and promoting understanding. So we can connect and find related content it also enables us to analyze the climate action landscape. We can see you know, how much content is coming up with a certain tag, you know, where new tags are emerging and how things are evolving. Maybe things are starting to, to bridge across multiple tags. And that's quite interesting in terms of seeing how things go uh, evolving and particularly under the different frameworks. And when we combine this with APIs, so these are application programming interfaces, this better enables us to content share between platforms because we can do that according to certain tags so we're pulling the relevant information through um, and as Sakana showed metadata is so important for supporting understanding and learning so this is something we really want to push um, and see how, um, being used so much more um, but obviously to to use a shared taxonomy effectively does require some standards for implementation we need consistency in how everyone's using it. We need protocols and governance for how it's updated and how it's evolved over time. So this is just a link to the roadmap that you know those are things that we've really thought about and have tried to build in there. Um, but what I also want to talk about um, from a bigger picture perspective is how this contributes to the bigger picture um, and transformed IKM. So there we go. Sorry, the slides can be a little bit slow. So the widespread adoption of a shared taxonomy in a way comprises a step towards linked data. So taxonomies and keyword tagging help us link data, but it's not yet linked data. Um, and linked data is the idea of linking all relevant content across the web to provide a global interrelated database, a web of data, or some call this the semantic web. And this is hugely powerful um, for ensuring people can find the information they need. Um, as Tim Berners-Lee puts it, with linked data, when you have some of it, you can find other related data. But this does require the publication of data in common standard formats to ensure that they're machine readable um, and accessible to different machines. Um, so this is something that we're hoping to use the roadmap to, to help us achieve together. Um, and if you want to know more about linked data, there's some links here and we'll, we'll share these slides after the presentation. But one key thing I want to note here is if we all publish our glossaries for SORO taxonomies according to these standards, we can better utilise and interrelate this data. So, for example, just showing the, the back end of pool party again, this is just a very simple link to um, the, uh, and, sorry, the DDpedia linked open data set. So this is the, uh, all the data on Wikipedia that's been made available in RDF format, which is a common, common format that enables sharing. So we can start to really link and utilize and cross fertilize a lot of our work if we do this. So that's kind of why it's one of the big features in the roadmap. On a related note, um, 
the widespread adoption of these taxonomies and moving together um, in these directions also comprises a link towards, sorry, a step towards fair data. So fair data is data that is findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable. A lot of us will be very familiar with this kind of framing. Um, but again, these require us to really think about standards um, and how we collaborate on the collaborate on the development of, of an adoption of standards to ensure we publish data in ways that conform to those principles. And say so there's some links there as well if you want to find more information on that if it's not something you're already familiar with. So taxonomy provides a, a foundation for powerful information knowledge management. This is already a big step forward. Um, spaces for keyword tagging to link related content, metadata for supporting understanding, related terms for suggesting content. Ontologies are an additional layer on top of that. They add the semantic information that provides additional contextual knowledge. And this is really powerful um, for supporting kind of smarter infrastructure down the line. So with ontologies, we can attribute characteristics to a term. So for example, we can designate certain methods as participatory. We can classify terms as, as a particular type of entity so we can say, you know, this is a decision support method. This is a policy framework. And we can just describe relationships between these terms. So we can say, for example, that community-based adaptation promotes sustainable livelihoods. And this additional expressiveness um, makes for much more powerful um, information knowledge management approaches. Um, they allow for multiple relationships. They allow us to derive uh, tacit and implicit knowledge regarding how terms are used and applied and make this explicit for machines and this enables machines to think more about more in a way that we think that provides this contextual knowledge um, and this can lead, lay the foundation for smarter decision support tools and more intelligent content recommendation because you have that additional semantic knowledge about how those terms relate so the systems can be much more clever in the way they connect users with the knowledge that they think they need and perhaps connect them with knowledge that they didn't realize they need, but the machine recognizes uh, that they do based on these relations. So going back to Roma, and this is why we think it's really important that we have a common ontology framework for adding this semantic information um, that outlines these classifications and the relationships that are most needed to support users um, and power these kind of tools. Um, I just want to say a brief word um, on how this takes us to the next level with knowledge graphs. Um, so knowledge graphs are where we think the future lies um, and together taxonomies and ontologies provide a detailed model of all the content in the subject area. This is the foundation of a knowledge graph. So this idea of having a roadmap that we kind of develop shared taxonomies, have a common ontology framework and then start to implement that helps us build a kind of a climate action knowledge graph and in a nutshell knowledge graphs can be envisaged as a network of all kinds of things relevant to a subject domain so it describes objects of interest their character their attributes and the relationships between them and that's really important for you know querying the system to understand how things relate to each other and that provides us a much more powerful um, search capability they can comprise numerous taxonomies, ontologies, and other knowledge organization systems. And, and so they can connect and bridge across multiple disparate sources of data. Um, and they also, as I said, make it possible to make very complex queries across all kinds of content and heterogeneous data sources um, and do this quickly. And this enables us to break up these existing data silos and connect data in smarter, more meaningful ways. Um, a book that I found really useful is this knowledge graph cookbook, which is the link there. So I recommend if anyone's interested in this, they, they have a look at that. Um, this is just an example of a very basic knowledge graph just to show this in context. And you can see how you've got these, these different objects and this is explaining how they link to each other. And if you can think how a decision support tool might be able to leverage this, I think this is a really powerful step forward um, for using IKM to really expedite climate um, action. Uh, knowledge graphs, for those that 
aren't so aware of this area, they are everywhere. So the way Alexa, Siri, Google connect us to knowledge, this is all powered by knowledge graphs in the back end. Um, and they can also, they're also really powerful for enabling AI applications because they provide the holistic, sophisticated view of knowledge domains with all that contextual knowledge about how things relate and interlink to each other. This enables machines to make connections that are intuitive to us. Um, and this can support all sorts of innovative approaches to integrating communicating knowledge that support this collaboration learning that's so desperately needed to achieve the goals under the Paris Agreement and other international agendas. Um, and also support dynamic responsive knowledge systems, which is a key user need that we keep seeing coming up and up again. And also new levels of data analysis. They make it possible to very quickly analyze, ana sorry, analyze huge um, data sets. So this is really cool. Um, we don't have so much time to talk about this here, but we are having another webinar on the 1st of July, July that will specifically focus on how a, the climate action knowledge graph that we can develop through this roadmap could be applied to really power these artificial intelligence approaches and how this can really help us expedite climate action. So to the roadmap, um, so hopefully people have had a chance to look at the report. So the roadmap comprises of six concrete steps that we can all think about doing now. Some of us are already doing a lot of those. Um, and then 16 steps for the medium and long terms that help us bring all of this work together. Um, and I wanted to, yeah, so the overview of that, as you can see in this figure, is that this involves a collaborative development and linking of taxonomies and a common ontology framework by various actors. So this is really inclusive collaborative approach um, and one that is informed by experts and fo really focuses on meeting user needs. Um, and then another step is the implementation and integration of these taxonomies and the use of the ontologies to produce the knowledge graph. I just want to say a quick word about the ideas behind it. With this, we really wanted to provide a collaborative, pragmatic process that people can join in at different stages and progress at different speeds, recognising that some communities will be interested, but we all have different capacities when it comes to contributing to such a process. Um, one that enables contributions at different scales. So this might be a very focused topic area, it might be a broad topic area. One that really recognises and makes use of all the work to date. And there is lots of taxonomies and ontologies already available that need to be incorporated and built on and shared and, and interrelated and used. And one that's achievable. And I think I really want to get this across. Um, we think that this, this is definitely achievable. It, there's a lot of collaboration. It requires some leadership and we can come back to that later but it is building on and making use of existing standards, protocols, technologies and thinking. So we can do this. And at its core, as I keep saying, is collaboration. Um, everyone uses terminology in different ways and we don't want to be too concrete about, no, you're right, you're wrong. It's, it's finding a way forward that brings some clarity um, to the system so that we can really support non-expert users and people really wanting to access this knowledge um, to be able to use it and apply it. So just to go into the detail, and I apologise, this is a bit dry with all the text, we haven't yet thought about a better way of going through this. Um, the roadmap, as I say, in its whole is 16 steps. And the idea is that it's, it's a very shared effort. So we have steps that are led by actor groups. These might be specific communities, for example, those working on ecosystem-based adaptation approaches. Um, sets that are addressed as a wider community, for example, the whole of climate change adaptation or perhaps even broader still. And those are undertaken by a combination of the two. And although we present it as a linear process, it's not Oh, in terms of numbering, it's not actually a linear process. These activities can be undertaken in parallel and iteratively. Sorry, it's going to have to These always happen at the most inopportune moments, don't they? So just to look at the first few steps, I would say it really wants to build on existing work. So the idea is we collate and evaluate what is already out there in these different focus topics. We look at all the different data, knowledge and information 
that is out there that will need to be described by these systems, by these technologies, and they'll need to be related by them. Really want to connect, we want to be very user informed. So conducting interviews and holding workshops with stakeholders to understand what content they use, what terminologies they use, what their, their needs are in terms of accessing information and knowledge and how they want to do that. It's really important to, um, to hone in on the design of the ICAM systems and, and how we want to integrate this knowledge, which will inform how the taxonomy and the ontologies are structured. And to share and discuss and use these outputs, of course, and these multiple steps that can kind of reflect back on earlier steps to say, how do we move forward in the best way possible? Um, and on the back of kind of these conversations with unit users and understanding where we are as communities, we can start to think about prioritised ICAM activities that we can start to meet with these taxonomies as a group. We can then think about standards for how we manage quality assurance. This is a huge topic. Um, we need to make sure that everything is of sufficient quality that users can know that it's legitimate and credible, um, but also for recommending what metadata we use, how we govern and govern taxonomies, the ontology and the, the resulting knowledge graph. And this includes decisions about the licensing and publishing. And of course, yeah, so there's these talk about more standards and governance, I mean, these keep coming back. So this is very much a phased approach of trying to, to cover these different stages. The common ontology framework really tries to build kind of, or just that a common ontology, you know, what relationships between terms do we need to provide? What categorization is really needed to really provide powerful ICAM systems that can really bring the right content to people or manage it so that machines can leverage this in applications to provide these dy dynamic pathways through knowledge that are of the most use to users. Uh, and obviously this talks about developing and enriching, you know, this is not a one-off effort. Taxonomies and ontologies will evolve through time just as the terminology we use, is, we use evolves through time and the frameworks that we work under evolve through time. So there is this iterative nature that we need to keep revisiting, keep expanding and keep working with subject experts to enrich these, these taxonomies and ontologies and make sure they are up to date and powerful as they can be. And of course, the main endpoint, and this can be an iterative throughout the process, is really analysing those overlaps and keeping connecting across these taxonomies so that we have this integrated system where we can really start to connect all of this information across these disparate communities, across these silos. And that is really the end goal of this roadmap is to really provide that high level of connectivity with the metadata that really supports users to understand it, with that semantic information that makes it really powerful to apply to new ICAM or new innovative ICAM approaches whether they be decision support tools, knowledge management systems, and then obviously artificial intelligence approaches, uh, sorry, applications are a part of that as well. So this kind of idea of moving towards smart systems. So there are multiple things we think we can be doing now. Um, and obviously, as I said, a lot of people are doing these things. So obviously we have good practice principles and standards. It'd be great if we could share more knowledge about that and kind of see what different communities are doing and what we can learn from each other. Uh, same goes for existing taxonomies and ontologies. During this work, we've kind of come across quite a few and you hear others through word of mouth. It'd be great if we can share these more explicitly with each other so that we all know what's available out there already. Obviously engaging experts to validate and improve them. A lot of us do this anyway, but this is a really important practice for making sure that these taxonomies are effective and, and suitable for purpose. Um, and obviously adopting and implementing these technologies within websites to tag content is a huge step towards, you know, realizing things like the connectivity hub and actually being able to let, relate data across these platforms, across these websites, so that we don't have these silos and this fragmentation. Um, APIs, I mentioned earlier, this is a huge part of interoperability and knowledge sharing between websites, which a lot of users are coming back to. This fits with this idea of having a single entry point or fewer entry points. 
um, and then they can go back they can be driven to those separate websites through those entry points and one of the most important things i think with all of this and that we can all maybe reinvigorate our efforts to do is promoting the awareness of of why ICAM is so important and how it can really support knowledge uptake how it can help exped expedite action um, i think it's still a very underappreciated um, activity it's kind of you know we want to put stuff online and as long as it's up online and looks pretty it doesn't matter so much but there's so much good information out there that is not being used because people just can't find it or they can't find it quickly enough so this is a huge problem and i think you know we really need to drive that awareness and get that buy-in from leadership that can get the, the investment needed which brings us to this slide and it's like what we think is really needed to get this process going so as i said the awareness the leadership to really drive these kind of agendas the investment to build capacity and literacy for icam as well and we've been on a very steep learning curve with this i know we've got much more experienced people online today and i look forward to hearing from them and then it comes back to this collaboration as well and this is kind of a shift in thinking about how we approach icam it's, it's approaching it as a much bigger community collaborating and linking across our data sets rather than having our individual silos and i i really hope that that is something that people share and, and want to want to pursue and obviously as i said standards and governance not the most exciting but so needed so on that note um i know we've got kristen on the line and i'm really glad you managed to join us um so agrivoc um, is an example of how you know, people have come together and done this really successfully and it's a big a very large extensive taxonomy ontology um, that is developed collaboratively so Kristen could I invite you to say a few words about this I mute myself that would help great thank you so much for joining us and good afternoon everyone um, Emma was also here earlier she's the agrovoc manager we're running the EGOD meetings this week, so she had to go. She apologizes for that. But yes, hello from Agrivoc. And we're so glad to have connected with the Blackheart project at the end. Oh, it looks like a really interesting process. And um, yes, Agrivoc is a large controlled vocabulary and thesaurus. It has about 37,000 concepts in about seven, and up, up to 38 languages, about 750 terms. So it's it's a very large linked open data set built with a voluntary network of editors who contribute to terms and concepts so we have exactly the same some of the same issues that you have when it comes to agreeing on terminology making sure we have the right and current terminology and uh, that, that we remain relevant and agile because it uh, this used to be very much used to, ta to tag uh, documents but increasingly it's being used to, to tag data sets and exactly as Julie mentioned, in the age of big data, we need to be able to link and find the data. And just because it's online doesn't mean that people find it or that it's accessible or usable. So, um, yeah, just nice to be here and congratulations on your work. And we absolutely uh, think you're doing a nice pragmatic approach when it comes to agreeing on taxonomies, sharing it, building expertise, listening to experts to validate it. And that there also is very much a business case for doing this. Fantastic. Thank you so much. It's great to have you here. And um, it was great to speak to you and Emma last week. I uh, completely understand not being able to stay on. We're so busy with virtual meetings now, I think everyone. So it's just great that you join at all. Oh gosh, this is many questions. So Kena, did you want to um, maybe start discussion? I'm going to leave it on that slide. Um, or we can go to the Google Doc perhaps yes so basically um this is really an opportunity for everyone to share some thoughts about what they've heard and and what as julia and kristen have said what what do you think is possible are there shared taxonomies and terminologies out there that perhaps we're not aware of um that we you know we could be working together as a community to um link better and connect better um and basically just to hear 
I don't know if anyone has any thoughts that they'd like to share, questions to ask. You can also put them in the chat. Um, and Andrew will help us field some of those questions. Um, so we have a question, a comment from Faye from WIFO um, to connect to the ISO. They've developed commonly agreed taxonomies for a long time. Yes. Yeah, this is uh, something we are aware of and uh, we do have colleagues working um, on those standards. So yes, that, that's something we are looking into and uh, we hope to take forward. Um, anybody else have any comments or questions, advice? I think we have people who are a lot more um, knowledgeable about this stuff than us probably. We are not uh, computer scientists or taxonomists by any stretch of the imagination. Um, Maybe we can say a little bit about how we're, you know, we have started building kind of generic taxonomies for CCA and DRR through merging a lot of the terms that have come from those different platforms in the hub. Um, and we're really looking at taking this work forward. So if there are people that are interested in collaborating, I think there's, there's sections under that Google Doc. Please do drop your name and your email address under there and, you know, we'll try and keep in touch as this work progresses and I say placard is coming to an end. It finishes at the end of this month. It's been a great few, well, I think five years for Sukana and a few less for me. Um, but we are working with key partners to take this forward. Um, so it would be good to kind of get a bit of a community going on this. Yeah. Thanks, Julia. I just dropped um, another link in the document that takes you directly to another page in that Google Doc. So there are different ways to engage with us um, and with the wider community. Um, there's a few options there in terms of if you're interested in the hub and helping us test and evaluate the hub, please add your name to that document. If you're interested in um, exploring more what's possible with taxonomies and um, new collaborations and projects around developing taxonomies, please add your name there. There's a few different options there and, and if you think of other ways to engage and maybe you're doing things that are relevant and related please add any details there um, we have a, th a question here about whether there are any thoughts on having an international convention to agree on terms um, which is a really good question and um, kind of goes back to the leadership uh, point that okay. julia was making um, so i think this is where we we kind of want to raise awareness about the value of this type of work and, and have some consensus on the need for that. So in different communities, there is already quite a, I mean, for example, the UN, UNDRR has its open-ended, international open-ended expert working group on terminology, I think it's called, um, who have been developing uh, and standardizing terms on DRR for, for a long time. Um, but again, we don't have the same on the adaptation side. Um, we have glossaries developed in the IPCC reports, and they're not, not published in a standardized format that we could automatically use, for example, in the hub. So this is one of the obstacles we came across in developing the hub. And then within the platforms where we've um, incorporated terms from across, across the five platforms in the hub, for example, different platforms are using different uh, tagging systems or some are actually just using expert driven processes so they're very valuable terms and very good terms and they're they're coming from experts but they're not classified in a formal way so we have this real tension between having a lot of good quality information out there but it's not shared in a way that we can reuse it or that's um, easily um, Hopefully that answers your question. Hopefully my mic is still working. Yeah. Did you want to follow up on that, Juan? I see you've got your video on. It's good to see you. Ah, hi, Juan. <laughs> Should I talk? We can hear you now, yeah. Yeah, perfect. Um, well, that, that sounds interesting. I was just thinking on, on another, well, it, it, I think all of this brings a lot of questions. Uh, first one I, I, or the first two, I think is, 
this calls maybe for what some people call like gatekeepers maybe like i i think there's a lot of need of people specializing on only managing these kind of systems and keeping them alive uh i don't know where funding for that will come from so that's kind of my first question and the second thing that i was thinking is looking at the last example you showed from fao um, it seems that most of the information you are looking at or the taxonomies are in English, but FAO shows like they have it in different languages. How much are you thinking about including things in other languages? For example, I'm, I'm from Colombia, so it would be interesting to also kind of see things in Spanish, which is it's another of the languages I use perhaps in my work. Absolutely. It's great to have you join. I imagine it's quite early in the morning. Um, yeah, so as I mentioned, I'm, one of our key partners is um, REAP, who have developed the Climate Tagger. Um, they developed, that is available in six languages. And that's definitely, I think, the, the aspiration is that whatever is developed is translated with experts um, into other languages. Of course, it has to be done with experts because literal translations don't always make sense. Um, so that is definitely something we want to do. Is say it's, it's getting funding and leadership to do this. I think as part of Placard, um, we were looking to institutionalize a lot of these approaches. There are still discussions ongoing on that. Um, and we're looking for funding for trying to, to pull these together and to, to start the grassroots, kind of really bringing people together to and they really talk about ICAM and how other people are doing it because even between the platforms that we work with and you know that are colleagues of ours there's not a lot of knowledge sharing on anything let alone this specifically um there are some projects that are underway now but you know this is this is still kind of a growing process um so i guess let's watch this space we're 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 doing our best and if anyone wants to join us so please drop your email and we'd be very glad to keep in touch with you. Wonder, did anyone else have any um, questions or thoughts or comments? Um, by all means, if you don't want to ask to the room, you can pop it in the chat. Or if you have reflections later, I say our details, uh, well, we, we can put our details in the Google Doc. So if anyone wants to get in touch with us, if you have a strike of inspiration or have a burning question, say tomorrow we can we can get in touch and take these things forward. Hi, if, if I can um, just jump in. Uh, first of all, thank you. Thank you very much um, for this presentation. My name is Rodrigo Jimenez and I'm uh, working at, uh, for the GIZ in a uh, project called the NDC Cluster. And we are now dealing with knowledge management and information and uh, this is very helpful of course also to understand from the basics of what is actually the terms that uh, we all need to have in mind and have in common and um, also very useful to know what is there uh, out there already and uh, yeah basically i would look forward to um, the content uh, the google docs and also the presentation to perhaps uh, have a closer look and uh, your contact details as well. Thank you. Thanks so, much. Thanks so much, Rodrigo. I also just wanted to mention that um, it's really interesting that you mentioned the NDC work that you're doing. Um, we, in the report that we've just published, um, you might find it useful to see there's a few case studies in the report which show how taxonomies and terminologies have been used to better organize and classify information for um, linking between the NDCs and the SDGs, for example, and for um, other work around the SDGs, around the European Green Finance Taxonomy. And so there's the World Bank, um, there's a, a nice example from the World Bank as well. So there's lots of uh, practical applications that we've tried to highlight in the report that might shed some light on how taxonomies can be useful for different areas of our work. Um, but yeah, we'd be happy to hear from you as well if you want to get in touch. Thank you. We had a raised hand from Kristen a few moments ago. We had a- Hi again. Hi, Just to say, I really want, I wanted to applaud the idea of looking at um, A, things like ISO 
and just just agreeing on authorities you would use for concepts and definitions is a big step for a community and not always simple because there isn't always an agree an international convention though that would be nice but as you say there are known authorities already working on disaster risk reduction for example and that means you're going to find collection controlled vocabularies translations definitions both that you might use but it also might benefit from your expertise and uh ones like agrivoc we're certainly very happy to hear about things we might be missing and to benefit from your your wisdom and your collections but we also have a lot of material in spanish you're very welcome to use that so just a good luck with the work it's uh, really important okay thank you very much Kristen. Uh, may i ask something else yes please uh just to be clear, what is kind of the nature of, of the collaboration that you're looking for? Uh, is it going to be in a voluntary basis or are you going to have a job positions, more formal job positions for collaboration? Uh, How is it going to work or, or what are the kinds of ways to engage in, in this kind of very interesting project? So I think one of the things um, that's really open, right, that, that's one of the things that's really open right now. So with, with the placard project ending, um, but with a lot of interest and new avenues opening up for the kind of work and challenges that we've been trying to address, um, there's still so much to do. And so we, we're basically hoping to find opportunities to work with others to take this forward. Um, one of the things will be to hopefully try and scale up the connectivity hub and increase its reach and visibility, the visibility of the content in there, increase the, the amount of content in there and the way that it can support the use of a shared taxonomy. Um, and that kind of is a test bed for lots of these technologies that Julia has been describing in terms of, you know, better developed taxonomies, uh, working towards ontologies and knowledge graphs. So we really see this as a fantastic opportunity to accelerate um, progress towards the goals that we're trying to achieve in our work. Um, and we actually just trying to explore what's possible and find out what others are doing as well. Um, you know, connecting with Kristen and Inman Agravoc has been great. Um, there's a lot of work that we were not aware of that we found while we were doing the research for the roadmap. Um, so, yeah, it's pretty open, really. I mean, we're looking for ways to engage on new projects. Um, there's lots of new proposals that we would like to write for this work. So I'd be happy to collaborate on any of those things. And language experts are always going to be high in demand, I think, because we do want to move in that direction. We, need, we do recognise that not everything in English and these kind of technologies are actually also very useful for linking content in different languages and, and helping a translation as well. So definitely. We've got a couple of minutes left. So if anyone has any questions, um, please ask them now. Um, we do want to keep to the hour because we realise everyone's got busy schedules. I just wanted to um, just reshare, uh, sorry, the um, where is everything? There we go. The webinar that we'll be hosting uh, with our partners who we, we mentioned, so that's Reef and um, the Semantic Web Company who we work a lot with, and they are the ones who host the Cool Party software that we've been using. Um, obviously there is other software, but it's one that we found very useful and they have been great partners. So that will be a much more technical uh, webinar, so really exploring how knowledge graphs, which is the end goal of the, of the roadmap, can be used to leverage these artificial intelligence approaches um, and so as most people on the report on the call will know ai is just it presents massive opportunities a massive potential obviously care needs to be taken um, but it's a very exciting field so if for those that are interested i do hope we'll see you there as well uh, so that was on first of july um, again in the evening so it'll be a slightly later time of five o'clock um, in Central European so hopefully a slightly more acceptable hour for our colleagues joining from South America um, and thank you again for joining it's, it's great to have people from across the world um, 
it's very much a global problem and we need global solutions. So. Yeah, and if I can finally just say that uh, the Google Doc will be open for you to contribute to for the um, at least the rest of uh, this week and maybe early next week. So if you'd like to put some ideas in there about how you'd like to work together to try and um, address some of these issues or if you'd like to just stay involved, if you're willing to be a user to test the hub, for example, or if you're um, uh, just want to stay informed about the latest updates, we'll be trying to put together a mailing list um, or have a discussion forum or something like that, that we can, um, as a way of, of staying connected and increasing uh, conversation around this as well. Great, thank you, Sukena. And I think we'll be sharing a recording of the webinar and we'll share the slides at the same time. Yep. Uh, probably by a Dropbox or something because there's a lot of images. Um, so that you have access to those links um, and we'll reshare the report in that as well, um, which has a lot more detail on the things we've been discussing. It's, it's quite difficult to synthesize something that large in, in just half an hour <laughs> with some discussion. So thank you again for joining. Um, and yes, we will be in touch with those who want to take this forward. Thank you again.